multilateral environmental agreements internationally uh, i think the the role of sustainability in the present uh, day world is bringing renewed emphasis on on chemistry and i i am talking to uh, the converted and the the chemical experts who are here they need not be told about the pivotal position that chemical industry occupies or the position of india globally as the sixth largest producer of chemicals those those are very well known facts but i think what we need to understand is that uh, while we are aware that we cannot live without chemicals it is also well known that certain hazardous chemicals pose very serious threat to human health and that's where the nexus between health and environment becomes so very important and what is what is the way forward in that regard would be adopting green and sustainable chemistry as an effective approach to minimize the use and impacts of these harmful chemicals and and i think that's the driving force behind the webinar that's being organized and also this club which has been set up uh, by various partners uh, would would need to uh, underline the fact that sustainable chemistry or green chemistry is only the way forward and this has already been highlighted so very well in the global chemicals outlook too uh, which highlighted the need of promoting green and sustainable chemistry uh, i think the more more one more important milestone in this whole approach is the recently concluded uh, united nations environment assembly in its fourth uh, meeting it had requested unep to synthesize uh, unep's analysis of best practices in sustainable chemistry into manuals on green and sustainable chemistry and by unia 5 uh, this part of the work was done and to continue this work on a holistic approach for a sound management of chemicals and i think this whole unia resolution and the work thereafter is becoming a important milestone in in the understanding of the chemistry and the importance of the chemical uh, sector in in environmental mitigation uh, while the report uh, which i'm talking of encompasses a lot of aspects related to sustainable chemistry and its guiding principles of minimizing chemical hazards or 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 avoiding regrettable uh substitutes or bringing in sustainable production processes uh it it is certainly a watershed kind of a report that needs to be disseminated much wider in the chemical industry i following the invitation that was sent to the indian chemical council last two days i've been in touch with them and they have circulated the the relevant information about this webinar to uh, their whole industry and i i do hope some of them are able to participate even though it was a small uh, a short notice but i i think involving the indian chem chem chemical council is at an india level is a very important step that uh, the club has taken and i think in the future webinars that vikram was mentioning we would be able to get more participation from them uh because and and i'm trying to emphasize this also because the indian industries can really play a very pivotal role in promoting green and uh, sustainable chemistry uh while this can be achieved by taking steps to innovate product design or harmonize research protocols or understanding as i said health or environmental linkages uh the indian chemical industry is strong enough and is forward looking and we've also been approached by them Uh, to to address some of these issues and we had recently organized a webinar on green chemistry with the industry of india and uh, we've also last two years with icc and icca been organizing a sustainability conclave for the chemical industry in india so i i think this webinar comes at a very opportune time and i would urge various stakeholders who are present and others who are not to join hands in identifying avenues of sustainable chemical production and management i i wish this discussions and webinar a uh, uh, big success and i would be looking forward to the outcomes of this webinar so that we can take them further with the indian chemical council thank you very much wonderful um mr atul i think uh, some of the points that were raised by uh, mr atul um one of the most important ones that comes to my observation is the health 
and environment uh, connection there and i think if nothing else but the impact on everyone's health um, i think that would be the most important driving factor for everybody to demand um, the change the paradigm shift that we are expecting uh, from everything uh, you know from consumption point of view or from the products you know the demand point of view and so on um, and yes a, you know a joining with uh, collaborating with the icc would uh, definitely um, you know boost uh, the objectives that we have set forth when we started the chemistry club um next i would like to invite uh, in dr jagale to to speak a few words and um, you know set uh, the perspective for today's session so you are on mute thank you so much vikram and um, all the team from isc3 for organizing this wonderful session i think we had a wonderful uh, series of talks uh, last year and uh, we have graduated now we have uh, who's who speaking here i'm very happy that this time united nations environment program uh, whether it's atul whether it's uh, sandra or colleen you know they they have joined this is really good the moment we are talking about sustainable chemistry we do understand the chemistry was not sustainable uh, in the past and uh, that's why we are talking about sustainable chemistry and uh, really i feel it's not only the chemistry for human but chemistry uh, for environment uh, in general because we have uh, uh, really changed a lot within this uh, within the biosphere in general uh, and we have changed the entire ecosystems i um, many times i feel so sorry that i get proposals from entrepreneurs they have disposable biodegradable plastic or dissolvable plastic somebody comes with a plastic and as it takes a glass of water from me and puts in water so oh, it's dissolved but then when we actually go into this this is that this is nothing but a different kind of polymer which dissolves so from visible plastic to invisible plastic which goes inside the water body and obviously in, inside the ecosystem inside the living living systems uh, i think it's a serious we at science and technology park uh, are committed uh, to promote entrepreneurship in sustainable chemistry uh, just 3 days ago our minister for transport mr nitin gadkari launched uh, two of our startups one is converting agricultural waste food processing industry waste into a uh, diesel like substitute which is exactly like a diesel probably better than diesel because this is zero sulfur diesel we are we are already doing that and we 68000 liters of diesel per day we are producing using uh, this waste and there's a huge potential to take this technology across the globe and uh, we'll be very happy to do that we also are producing of course other pro products converting plastic and thermocol polystyrene into Uh, the fuel and alternative uh, material which are useful so that all this thermocol and plastic becomes uh, economically viable to harvest so people will be more than happy to collect and sell it to the companies i would suggest uh, vikram um, and uh, all the people from isc3 whether we could launch um, with unep support a global uh, grand challenge for entrepreneurs for for startups for a sustainable chemistry if you could do that even if we get 10 companies uh, of course those companies which are within india uh, science and technology park will be more than happy to even financially support at early stage uh, when there is a the substantial risk uh, we we have some funding available to do that we have connects in in russia connects in us uh, in taiwan in hong kong i'm sure that some of our partner in incubators and science and technology parks they will be more than happy to financially even support such entrepreneurs uh, working in the sustainable uh, alternatives for chem for chemicals so that that could some day we should think of uh, taking such a grand challenges i think there are many other speakers to speak i will stop here because i'm not a chemistry man i'm i'm um, <laughs> i know what can be done but i do not know hardcore chemistry thank you so much vikram for inviting me 
Thank you, Dr. Jagdalia, for those uh, wonderful lines. Um, definitely, we we would love to have a global grand challenge, and let's see who joins and who supports. Um, it's always been a challenge to to get the kind of support that we expect, but I think uh, we can take the leadership in that, and we see. Even even some mm -hmm. of the technologies which are already developed, there's no database. And that locally available, so we we can take that challenge as a, as a, as our mission to take yes. those technologies and disseminate those technologies elsewhere in the world. That itself, uh, we don't Certainly. have to reinvent the wheel. We have to just disseminate. Yes. Yes. Um, the other interesting then that uh, point that you have mentioned is the impact of the chemicals on the entire biome, the biodiversity ecosystem. I think that's a very critical aspect. And the negative impacts are now slowly coming out and uh, in in you know in light for everybody to see. So I hope that the webinars that follow this roundtable and the stakeholders that have joined us help us navigate this complex uh, situation that we have in we have created for ourselves. And uh, we look forward for having some good technologies uh, that can be supported and promoted on a wider scale. Thank you once again, Dr. Jagdali. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Alexis to share a few words and uh, um, share his, uh, you know, deepest insights into how he sees um, chemistry, sustainable chemistry moving forward. Dr. Alexis. Yeah, thank you, Vikram. Um, yeah, I will make it uh, short uh, for, for the sake of time, but uh, as representative of the Innovation Hub of IC3 and on behalf of our, my entire team, uh, also warm welcome from my side. Um, we are very happy to co-host and to co-organize this uh, roundtable India and um, yeah and being part of the uh, uh, in the, uh, International Sustainable Chemistry Club. Um, we um, at, at IC3 Innovation Hub uh, we currently support around 165 startups around the globe. Uh, within our global startup service program. And uh, we strongly believe that um, startups um, are very important and have a specific role or key role in the transformation of uh, the chemical sector towards sustain, uh, sustainability. And uh, with um, um, the chemistry sector in this sense, we don't uh, refer to uh, chemicals producing companies only, but we really mean all, also all downstream sectors using and building on uh, chemicals and uh, chemical based materials. And so this, this is all included here. Um, in, in the framework of our global startup service, we guide startups uh, and support them on their journey towards um, sustainable business. and. Uh, in that sense, we are very happy uh, that this uh, roundtable uh, and also the, all the uh, follow-up uh, webinars we will have in, where we, in which we want to specifically highlight um, um, startup innovations and how they uh, contribute to individual of the green and sustainable chemistry uh, objectives um, and that we give them uh, an arena for showcasing and that we get a bit more tangible information or feeling on what uh, sustainable chemistry might entail and uh, which amazing in, in, uh, innovations are out there and how they refer to uh, sustainability criteria. So that being said, uh, I would like to conclude and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, session and all, all the follow-up sessions we will have in the future. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Alexis. Um, I I really look forward for some very interesting solutions and technologies that we will be talking about in the webinars uh, that will follow after this roundtable. And um, I I will definitely look for all the stakeholders who are present right now to share um, their resources to support the commercialization or for the wider absorption of these technologies and accelerate uh, sustainability in, in, in all aspects coming from the chemistry background. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alexis, uh, once again. Um, moving ahead um, after the introductions, um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sandra from UNEP to 
to deep um, to dig a deal little deeper into the the topic of sustainable chemistry and also highlight um, and share the importance of uh, the ten principles that have been laid down um, to introduce uh, Dr. Sandra. Um, she is a program officer at uh, UNEP, and um, she comes from the chemical and health uh, branch, and she coordinates uh, various different activities in terms of uh, you know green and sustainable chemistry and uh, uh, chemicals in products and so on, and uh, uh, has been engaging with uh, a lot of private sector industries, SMEs, and so on. So I think she comes from a uh, she comes from a background of that industry, academia, uh, plus the global policy level, institutional level approach. So I welcome uh, Dr. Sandra, please. Um, the session is yours. All right. You're on Sorry, I, I've been trying to share my screen and it somehow froze, but um, are you able to, to see uh, the, the screen, which is supposed to be the presentation? We can see the screen okay okay uh, thank you are you able to make it full screen i'm trying okay let's do it this way if that's okay with everyone <laughs> is it better Yes. Okay. Um, so I thank you very much for the invitation to uh, this round table and uh, it's really uh, an honor for us to be able to uh, share uh, some more information on the uh, UNEP Green and Sustainable Chemistry Manual and um, and to have uh, such a program that will be uh, looking into it into really a uh, deep dive. Um, so we are really very thankful for, for the organizers and also for all the, the participants and all the startups to this program um, to make green and sustainable chemistry a, a reality. Um, UNEP has uh, worked on, on chemistry for a long time and, and Dr. Uh, Atul Dagai has been uh, highlighting um, the, the Global Chemicals Outlook 2, uh, which is one of our foundational um, publication, uh, looking into, you know, why do we need green and sustainable chemistry in the first place? And one of the findings of the Global Chemicals Outlook 2, which was um, released in 2019 uh, was that uh, business as usual is not an option. And uh, some of, of the elements of it are I highlighted here in the slides that um, we do have hazardous chemicals and, and other pollutants that continue to be released and are ubiquitous in humans and in the environment. Um, there is a, a growth in the chemical intensive industry sectors and here uh, linking to what was mentioned by Alexi, when we look into chemistry, it's not just the chemicals manufacturing, but it's also the sectors using chemical. And there is a consumer demand. Uh, there are green and sustainable chemistry education and innovation um, that are important drivers of change and that exist, uh, but are not being scaled up at the moment. So what is needed also to make sure that um, the, the whole um, um, environment of chemistry uh, becomes green and sustainable. Um, I want to highlight uh, also an element that was uh, touched upon in the introduction that, that chemistry is, is really um, 
somehow at the center or underlining um, our progress towards sustainability. Uh, and, and it has strong potential. So it has potential for circularity and including through uh, product design and uh, supporting reduced um, resource use, alternative feedstock, also through the design um, supporting the phase out of, of chemicals that are fond of concern. Uh, it has a potential related to climate change. It has a potential related to, to pollution. Dr. Atul has uh, highlighted the resolution at UNEA in, in 2019 that was um, requesting UNEP to develop manuals for green and sustainable chemistry. And these manuals were actually uh, presented uh, at UNEA 5 a couple of months ago uh, in Nairobi. Uh, and the UN Environment Assembly, so uh, composed of, of uh, the member states, uh, universal membership of member states, welcomed the green and sustainable chemistry uh, manuals and highlighted the crucial importance of environmentally sound innovation and encouraging their use as appropriate. So um, it's really uh, what we're doing today. And, and so we're, we're in a way uh, starting responding to, to this call for use and action. If I um, deep dive a little bit further on the framework manual, and I'll be happy to, to provide in the chat uh, some more information. Uh, and the link to the manuals. Um, it, it's organized in a way through the why um, green and sustainable chemistry and what this means uh, and how do we enable it. Um, and so the, the objective is really to, to foster the, the learning, the reflection and, and scale up the action. Um, based on a common global understanding of green and sustainable chemistry. Uh, so this slide is outlining the, uh, the different chapters and um, I'll be looking into the 10 objectives, uh, which are the, the main uh, topic of the discussion um, today and, and in the coming months. Um, these 10 objectives and guiding considerations for green and sustainable chemistry have been developed together with the manuals uh, through a consultative process and uh, with um, between 50 and, and 80 experts uh, providing inputs to these, um, to these manuals. Uh, and we are very thankful of, of the generous support of, uh, of, of member states to allow us to do that, in particular at the government of Germany and, and of Sweden. Um, these 10 objectives are, are very complementary and, and they're moving in a way from um, uh, green um, engineering of, of chemistry and, and towards um, more sustainability aspects, but they're all important. Um, so we have the minimizing the chemicals hazard as, a, as the first uh, objective, avoiding regrettable substitutions as well as the regrettable alternatives, uh, the sustainable sourcing of resources and feedstocks, advancing sustainability of production processes, advancing sustainability of products, um, minimizing chemical release and pollution, enabling a non-toxic circularity, to which we touched upon a bit earlier, maximizing social benefits, protecting workers, consumers, and vulnerable population, and developing solutions for sustainability challenges. So they are really ranging from the green molecular design to ensure that chemistry works to address the societal needs. And they are really um, offered to stakeholders engage in chemistry innovation, in chemistry management or in policy development, um, hoping that they will promote innovation that will help unveil the full potential of, of chemistry that is compatible with and supporting 
the implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the SDGs. Um, so I've added a, a couple of uh, slides that uh, develop and explain a little bit further the objectives and guiding consideration. And if slides are shared later on or put on the web, I think that would be helpful to dig into um, these objectives. But conscious of the time, I'll, I'll skip these details. Um, and just highlight how key stakeholders are actually important. And um, in your introduction, you, you've highlighted the, the, the background from somehow a multi-stakeholder approach. And, and that's also the background of, of this manual and of the work on green and sustainable chemistry. It's really about making sure that all actors can shift towards green and sustainable innovation. Um, and so here in this slide, you can see a number of, of these actors. And of course, entrepreneurs, innovators, startups are a very important part of it. Um, the chemical uh, industry uh, as well. Um, the brands or the sectors using industry, definitely. Um, but representatives from consumer information, from the workers, the intermediaries such as the distributors and retailers, but also the, the policymakers, the academics and research institution with the very important um, element of education in green and sustainable chemistry, um, are uh, the waste sector, of course, are also very, uh, very important actors to, to bring together. Um, I realized that through this, um, through this series of webinars, we'll, we'll have a very specific focus on startups and, and just wanted to highlight how um, startups innovation, um, eco-innovative business models are, are critical uh, to this agenda and are critical to sustainability. Um, so I think I, I'll stop there um, and I'll just uh, encourage everyone to be uh, thinking um, broad, innovatively, uh, out of the box, and to be sharing the, the best practices and, and the best ideas for green and sustainable chemistry. Um, and really looking forward to, to hearing the, the debate. Um, I, I would also like to uh, conclude by, uh, by just saying a, a few words. I, I saw there is a in the chat, uh, a, a company uh, working on the empowerment of, of women, in particular in textile upcycling, uh, encouraging women um, to um, to be very active in this uh, in this dimension, and to be um, recognized as well uh, in their in their work uh, in startups and in uh, scientific domains. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandra. I think it was a um, it was a very insightful uh, little um, talk. Um, however, I I do understand that you know the complexity of this topic will require the ten webinars to to deep, you know to dive deeper into each of the ten principles, uh, and that's how we have planned it. And uh, I I I do I do um, you know appreciate uh, the point that you have brought up about the role of startups and uh, also the SMEs. Um, while you know we've seen some of the larger companies um, uh, are a little sluggish in changing their direction, but really speaking, it's the startups and the SMEs that drive that that shift or the paradigm shift that is required. And I think you really brought that point up. And um, again, you know, uh, the, the joint action by stakeholders with the convergence of all the stakeholders is absolutely important. And I think we all agree with that. Um, so um, uh, I would like to have uh, more inputs from you during our panel discussion as well. Um, we want to hear more insights from your what your experiences have been. 
in promoting the 10 principles of uh, sustainable chemistry. So, um, so moving forward, I would like to invite our panelists for today. Um, this is going to be a very exciting, a very interesting panel discussion. Um, we will have the opportunity to take some questions um, at the end of the session. Uh, you can uh, type your questions in the question answer box um, uh, and we will uh, you know, collate them and uh, have a go at it at the end. Um, if there are any specific speakers whom you wish um, to address the questions to, please, uh, note, please make a note of that as well. So I will start with a little bit of an introduction. We've got um, Dr. Rajay Deshpande today joining us as a panelist. Um, so he is currently uh, a member of the Asian Development Bank Compliance Review Panel, which is a very, very um, empowered group, as I believe. Um, he has more than 27 years of experience working with uh, pollution control boards in India, uh, you know, working with uh, environmental policy planning and environment clearances and so forth. And he has also served as a adjunct professor at IIT Bombay, and uh, he's, he's had uh, various roles with uh, a, as committee member or as an expert panelist with uh, pollution boards, including the Maharashtra State Pollution Control Board, uh, and also with the National Green Tribunal of India. So uh, welcome, Dr. Rajay. Um, so you're on Thank mute. you. Thank um, you. So with uh, Dr. Rajay, we have uh, Mr. Nitesh Mehta. Now, Nitesh Mehta has spent more than a couple of decades in, in uh, successfully driving two, two different uh, you know, uh, ends of that, the spectrum, I would say. One is the uh, uh, a Green Chemistry Foundation that, that works to promote sustainable chemistry. And on the other end, um, uh, he's also a founder of a sustainable chemistry based uh, business. So I believe he's got, uh, you know, a wide range of insights from promoting to actually practicing uh, the business of uh, sustainable chemistry in India. Um, and I'm sure he agrees that it's not an easy task to do in India. Um, he's also a chemistry in the chemical engineer from IIT Bombay. So I look forward for uh, your inputs, uh, Mr. Nitesh. Um, Thank you, Vikram. And um, our third panelist is Dr. Uh, Chanakya from Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. So uh, yes, we have him there now. Uh, so formally, he has headed the uh, Sustainability uh, Center for Sustainability Technologies, and he's also been the chief uh, research scientist at IISC Bangalore. Um, he has served on various national and state government uh, committees and pollution control boards, um, including the, uh, the Karnataka Pollution Control Board, uh, the Central Pollution Control Board, and he's also uh, deeply associated with the uh, government of India ministries um, and with the uh, you know, Department of uh, Science and Technology and Department of uh, Biotechnology and so on. So he has had a very um, diverse um, role, starting as a researcher and an academician, and then progressing towards policy level uh, interventions, and you know bridging that gap with the industry, um, government, and academia. So and he has uh, he has been working at the tail end of uh, you know the industry when we talk about waste uh, processing. Um, so he's got uh, a lot of different different um, insights to share with us. Um, and then we also have uh, Dr. Sandra with us and with her uh, from UNEP, uh, we also have uh, Mr. Colin, uh, if he's there. Um, I'm not sure if he's there. Um, but Colin works uh, at UNEP uh, as a consultant uh, and he specializes in sustainable chemistry. So I would like to, um, first of all, invite our panelists to share a few words on on setting the, the, the context for this panel discussion. So I would like to begin with inviting um, Dr. Rajay Deshpande uh, and share with us, you know, uh, what 
uh, his observations have been in terms of the progress in India that he has seen of adoption of sustainable chemistry principles. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Vikram. Uh, it is really a very important event at a very uh, critical time. Uh, India has uh, really undertaken a very big program in terms of Atmanirbhar Bharat and Make, Make in India program. And in fact, uh, India is known as a fancy of the world, but at the same time, we are expanding that base in a very, very significant manner. So if you really see from that chemical industry long-term perspective, it's we are really growing big. We are thinking big about the future growths also. But at the same time, by working with Pollution Control Board and NGT and now in the environment sector also, this also has a flip side on the environmental front. We have many areas which are polluted, critically polluted, what we call it is a SEPI area. And many of them have really uh, chemical industries as a predominant industries. And particularly with the pharma sector, as well as the other fine chemicals. Uh, and one another important feature of the Indian chemical industries, many of them are in the small scale sector. And that really is, uh, has a different set of environmental consideration when we talk about compliance and monitoring and all of this. So with this background, uh, it has been well appreciated. The problem of pollution has been well appreciated and government has taken several steps, both at the chemical industries or chemical ministry point of view, as well as the environment ministry point of view. But I think this subject of sustainable chemistry or even more precisely the green chemistry provides an opportunity uh, to really change the overall picture. And with the focus, Government of India has now really put on the circular economy. One of the major theme is to reduce the hazardous and uh, toxic waste from the uh, value chain. And one of the major or one of the strategy which was planned is a circular economy. So Government of India, for, by the way, has formed some 11 committees uh, for promoting the circular economy and for developing the circular economy action plan. And those reports are being now compiled by Niti Aayog and to develop a very important strategic action plan for the country in terms of circular economy. So I think this, this has really uh, put a lot of emphasis on the cleaner processes. We have different uh, levels actually. When we talk about uh, sustainable chemistry many times the focus is on normally on the downside downscaling like like we are talking about waste management per se but really the sustainable chemistry or green chemistry talks about upscaling efforts so what type of raw materials should be consumed what, what type of processes should be there can we replace certain uh, inputs can we have some different catalysts so basically it's, it's a very uh, integrated view which has to be taken not only restricted to the west per se uh, I will be speaking more about the strategies and the policies in the discussions, but I think this, this with this opening remark, I feel sustainable chemistry is the only way uh, we can go forward if we really want to develop our chemical industry under the Atma Nirvan Bharat scheme. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Chanakya to share a few words. I believe um, Dr. Chanakya, you You've had a lot of experience with uh, the academic side and also with the pollution control and other policy level instruments that the government has. And uh, you have observed um, the gaps that are present there. Um, we would like to understand more about that. Thank you. Uh, I think just now you heard exactly what I wanted to talk about and uh, start about the thing. Thank you for the beautiful introduction uh, given as to where India stands and uh, how the from the policy side and from the strategy side, uh, things are going in the direction of uh, sustainable chemistry. And what I would like to bring to the table is on one side, the academic as to are we preparing people to look at the concept of sustainability in any of the innovations, especially when we talk about startups and SMEs, 
So here is where uh, I have found uh, that uh, we have not uh, sort of brought in strong concepts of sustainability in our uh, education, in our uh, curricula, and also how do we implement it? And this is something that uh, I would like to bring to the table saying that at some point of time, when somebody, anyone with uh, any innovation which involves some amount of chemistry, we then prepare them on a beautiful business plan. We train them on to how to do lean businesses or lean uh, uh, com companies when we teach them a lot, lot about the business practices and how they should go. But I think what is important at that point of time is that we should also bring in an understanding, as uh, <clears throat> the previous speaker rightly said, not looking merely at waste, which is now considered as something extraneous to the innovation. So you hire a consultant to take care of it, and it's not really your problem. And uh, upfront itself, right, uh, upstream itself, do you? How do you see that you your innovation meets the certain requirements? And the second point is when we are looking at innovations at the academic and perhaps in the I'm I, I'm not uh, saying academicians are in uh, innovators, even other places, there must be some kind of awareness that when you apply for a for a clearance or for environment clearance, what kind of sustainability components are going to emerge and not merely an environmental issue. So your greenness should not be saying that I'm eliminating waste, but I'm trying to improve on other aspects of sustainability and we need to bring in some understanding of sustainability metrics into when uh, to any innovator, anybody who is going to have a startup and a, uh, an SME, and perhaps see how we can also dovetail this into existing uh, industrial systems. And especially when, uh, like uh, when we have a, a business plan and a financial system uh, looks at it very carefully, there's a need to look at, even at that st uh, stage, even before it goes into some kind of clearances, are we green? What are the metrics that we can have? So when we put this kind of a plan and innovation, uh, we subject it to upfront itself, and we have the training within the innovators that this can be done, then we have really created a beautiful foundation to take on only, I mean, really good uh, green innovations up uh, and push it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chanakya. I think that these two points have been um, very critical for this discussion. I completely agree that uh, just eliminating waste is not the solution. And we need to look at a, a holistic approach, uh, you know, something like a life cycle approach for, for the whole value chain. Um, so I would like to um, move to Mr. Nitesh. He's been in this, uh, in this business for the last 20 years. Um, I would like to understand from you, Mr. Nitesh, uh, in terms of the life cycle assessment or the holistic view or the up, up, you know, upstream and downstream, you know, there's a whole um, uh, wide variety of opportunities that are available for sustainability to be, uh, to be achieved. Um, so what is your perspective and from your experience, uh, uh, how, how, how have you managed to um, bring this into your business. Uh, thank you, Vikram. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Great. So uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity, uh, both to SciTech Park as well as to uh, ISC3. Uh, so uh, the way uh, uh, I see is uh, one, uh, you know, just to make a point uh, uh, before uh, the last 20, about 25 years that we have spent uh, in these two uh, uh, in these two domains, I would say one uh, running the nonprofit organization and two uh, running our business uh, where we are offering some environmental or sustainable chemistry solutions to the industry. One of the common observation interacting with various stakeholders, uh, be it uh, the academic and research institutes, be it certain uh, regulatory bodies like pollution control board, be it uh, certain uh, uh, sets of students or uh, industry, industrial associations. One common theme that we have seen uh, across the, that while uh, many are places, each one of them may be working in their own silos. But one thing that's common is that there is a 
commitment towards uh, you know uh, being pollution free there is a commitment to reduce uh, environmental pollution uh, you know at across the place uh, is just that certain places the uh, you know collaborative efforts uh, or a very synchronized or harmonious approach may be missing uh, some of these uh, stakeholders may be working uh, in their own uh, uh, silos and not uh, maybe collaborating or interacting enough uh, with uh, other stakeholders but one thing that's common is uh, that everybody is committed to environmental uh, sustainability i'm yet to come across an industry who wants to pollute uh, uh, they may be doing uh, uh, or you know finding out certain ways uh, uh, to deal with a certain situation on a practical uh, level i'm not saying that it should be allowed but i'm just saying that you know there's nobody who willingly wants to pollute so everybody is on the same side when it comes to environmental uh, sustainability is just that our efforts needs to be on the uh, you know much more collaborated uh, and uh, synchronized so that we could move at a much more uh, faster pace uh, coming to our own uh, uh, organization one thing that we've done uh, uh, especially is to uh, train our team on thinking uh, so you know it's the same so we've got a team of about 80 people out of which about 35 of them are chemists and chemical engineers and who you know develop and customize uh, various technologies and uh, take it to commercial scale in chemical plants so one of the things that we have uh, uh, noticed is that they all these chemists 35 of them that we have all the team members are trained uh, through the same bsc and msc curriculums that anybody else is uh, they have not been given any special training on green and sustainable chemistry is just that they when they are developing the process then when they are uh, uh you know uh, thinking about innovating uh, on a process uh they are keeping those 12 principles of green chemistry in mind they are keeping sustainable chemistry on the background uh, and then questioning the solvent being used questioning the uh, water consumption uh, questioning the possibility of recycle of water in the process questioning the possibility of recovery of some of the byproducts that are generated in the pro in the process so that it could be you know used uh, somewhere else as a raw material and uh you know the loop can be closed uh so uh, i think the key point is to start thinking uh, uh from that perspective keeping uh certain sets of basic principles of sustainable and green chemistry in the background uh and then once you're thinking from that perspective i think whatever would be the outcome uh, would turn out to be uh, more greener and sustainable as compared to what otherwise uh, it could uh, have been yeah thank you mr nitesh um those are some very critical points um i have one question that i want to pose maybe to dr deshpande um but are you still there yes you still there um from a unep sustainable chemistry principles point of view what is your um, observation in terms of the government initiatives that you mentioned including the un uh, including these guidelines you know the unep guidelines into the government of india policy framework um, what is the depth of penetration that these policies have see uh, the uh, the un policies are always referred whenever the national level policies are being debated and talked about uh, generally the policy making process is very robust uh, it involves different stakeholder including the industries and all that but at the same time i feel the basic principles of the sustainable chemistry remains the same more or less remain the same what is more important is actually the strategy to implement those three through different set of interventions certain policies or maybe certain uh, maybe uh, some sun like like schemes like like today we don't have any objective criteria what should be called as a green chemistry what should be called as a sustainable chemistry like if i am a industry person and if i claim to be a industry having sustainable chemistry who will certify for that so that type of things are really required from the technical uh, side as technical front but at the same time what uh, actually atul bagai ji also mentioned uh, the another important or even dr jaddai mentioned is showcasing the success stories and passing on that message for up, upscaling of those efforts i think this is one yeah. area which is important and i think one institute uh, gujarat clean production center G gcpc i think they have done a fantastic work they they documented some of the success stories but they they did it on a very initial scale so 
maybe such webinars and UNEP can help uh, to develop such all India level success story document, which can be definitely a uh, important uh, support for the industries who want to go for this. But the more important is uh, there has to be a well validated documentation on what is sustainable chemistry, how it can be implemented, what can be the cost of that. So definitely it is a process which has to start from the basics. Yeah. Yes. Now, from our observation, we've seen that uh, there are uh, many, there are many small industries. Uh, even Mr. Nitesh pointed out that, uh, you know, a variety of action is happening across different aspects of the industry, across different industries as well. Um, but we don't see them coming together as a as a platform so um to uh, uh, to my mind i think the unep sustainability uh, the chemistry principles offer a platform for the discussion to continue uh, i am also hoping that the government of india policy creates a platform um i'm curious to understand whether the government would be then you know a designing the innovation fund uh, or uh, startup support fund or business support fund, similar to the ones that are promoted by DST and DBT and Atal Innovation Mission and so on. I'm just curious to understand because you know without those resources, it is only an academic exercise. I, I really don't know what the government will do, but, but what I can say is there are sufficient funds available in different ministries, but the I think the need of the hour is to formulate the basic uh, framework uh, and then really approach the government with, with certain proposals or something. I think under the circular economy, government is serious on that. And uh, definitely there will be positive consideration. But uh, I think the process should not be driven by the funds available with the government. It should, available, it should be driven by the innovations and the market because finally market is the uh, is important and uh, if if we are talking about sustainable chemistry theoretically and logically it you it use minimum resources it is a resource efficient industry and and de definitely there will be uh, economical pluses on that it, it will not be a only question is uh, if you want to change over to certain processes it might require some funds but theoretically the sustainable industry uh, need to be an economically positive industry sure um, those are some really valid points. I see um, Dr. Sandra has raised her hand. Um, yes, Dr. Sandra, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as as much as I hear from the the, the different intervention, it it really adds to uh, <laughs> uh, to to what I wanted to highlight. But maybe um, initially. Vikram, you mentioned like a holistic approach, and and you referred to to life cycle thinking and and to life cycle approach, and and I think that's really a, a, a key uh, concept behind uh, what we're trying to do is to really look into all the different inputs into a process, and ultimately what a products will 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 have, and and then into uh, into the end of life of these products. So looking into the impacts at the different stages of, of the value chain, uh, whether it's the extractive or the um, raw materials, whether it's the production process, the use, the transportation, uh, and, and again, the end of use maybe <laughs> rather than end of life. So I just really wanted to highlight this as an underlining um, concept and that, that is necessary to be able to claim uh, sustainability, um, and uh, and I, I I completely also wanted to echo what Dr. Ajay had, was um, was putting on the table. Um, there is certainly a market opportunity, and and there there are. Um, the need for enabling support, enabling um, policies, enabling education, including education of those um, that are already uh, working in companies, so a, a lifelong learning. Um, 
but there are also the the market dynamics and uh, there maybe I'm, I'm going a little bit ahead of your plans i'm sorry for that but there was a, a question in the chat um, uh, asking about the motivations for a new entrant or a manufacturer uh, to adopt sustainable chemistry and and i think when we look into the motivations we heard um, human health, uh, protecting the environment. Um, but from a company perspective and really from a business driver perspective, it's this providing a comparative advantage for the client. Um, it has the potential for opening new markets because the, the, it's the trends that, that we are seeing right now and, and uh, what is being requested um, from some consumers, but also from policymakers. Uh, it's also the brand's requirement, so responding to brand's requirement for being um, more green and more sustainable. Um, it also allows to be ahead of regulation. Um, and, and it is very uh, likely that regulations may come and, and it's really giving a comparative advantage, um, whether it's at the international level on chemicals with, with the multilateral and uh, environment um, agreements and for example the Stockholm Convention uh, or whether it is at the national level um, and finally it's also a question of image for the company uh, to, to be you know aligned with what it's claiming and its its principles so I just wanted to highlight these points yes um, dr Sandra I think uh the brand, the image, and the market access, and the market appreciation, and the customer base, I think these are the most motivational points uh, that you have rightly said. Uh, Mr. Nitesh, um, I see uh, you raised your hand. Uh, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add two points to what uh, Dr. Sandra and Dr. Chanakya pointed out. One uh, was, uh, uh, you know, what Sandra was, shares, uh, was sharing that Today, when we see the chemical industry, the middle management, you know, obviously the top management or the CEO managing director level, there's already, there is a pressure from the investors uh, and uh, other senior stakeholders about uh, the company going green you know, and uh, trying to reduce its environmental footprint. So at the very top level, uh, there's no doubt that there is a level of uh, awareness and uh, the market and various forces in the market are already tracking, uh, you know, how a company is doing on the sustainability front. Uh, but it's the middle management who actually takes uh, the, you know, the vice president or the general manager level of people in a company who usually take the decision at the ground level in terms of certain initiatives being identified and executed. And uh, 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 we need to realize that this general manager or vice president sets of people were, you know, probably graduated in chemistry or chemical engineering, maybe about 15 years back or 20 years back. Uh, when uh, uh, sustainability, green chemistry or green and sustainable chemistry was not uh, probably heard so much. Uh, and that's where uh, I think a critical piece of this puzzle is to, uh, you know, create that kind of an awareness campaign and awareness program for senior uh, and middle management level of decision making level of people so that they start, uh, uh, you know, which kind of enables them to see what green and sustainable chemistry can bring to the table. Uh, and that helps them in identifying and executing certain initiatives. The second piece, uh, uh, which Dr. Chanakya pointed out is the second generation of or the next generation of our you know, chemistry, chemical engineering students who would be moving into the industry. So I think this two levels uh, of one is the middle and uh, uh, middle management level in the organization and two, the next generation of chemists and chemical engineers that are moving into the organization, if already they come in with a mindset of thinking green and sustainable from the entire uh, life cycles perspective, uh, then, uh, you know, right from the beginning, whatever new process developments are happening uh, would be much greener than otherwise uh, uh, what it would have been. Uh, the la third and last point that I wanted to add was one of the things that I personally believe uh, missing uh, or which could probably make a big difference is kind of a, uh, uh, you know, empowered body in our country, which is heading this entire green and sustainable chemistry uh, drive, like a a uh, country level uh, uh, body which is uh, trying to create a focus uh, and a very coordinated effort between 
uh, green and sustainable chemistry. It's creating kind of a blueprint, uh, uh, you know, uh, where the country is going to be in the next uh, uh, maybe 5, 10 or 15, 20 years in terms of green and sustainable chemistry. What are going to be the different steps in which how that goal will be achieved? And uh, while moving towards the goal, what's the role that different stakeholders are going to play? Uh, and over a period of time, uh, uh, measure, monitor, keep a track of those things and make sure that all the stakeholders are appropriately contributing in that direction. I think that kind of a body uh, uh, could make a big, big difference. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Mr. Nitish. Um, that nodal agency or that driving body um, is absolutely important. And uh, as Dr. Rajay also mentioned, that framework is also very important uh, within which the policy structure can evolve and thrive and then that stakeholder convergence can happen. Um, I am interested in understanding from you, Dr. Janakya, is you mentioned about the, um, and I completely support that, the importance of education and uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, it is rightly put across by Dr. Nitesh, uh, Mr. Nitesh, that the middle management in every company is also uh, equally uh, you know, responsible for driving this change or for not driving this change. Um, so what is your um, uh, insight into what is stopping us from uh, adopting these principles as um, part of our curriculum? Or um, how do we tackle this um, education side of things or sensitization side of things. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nitesh and uh, Ajay made beautiful points on this particular thing and taking it forward. What uh, comes to front is that in our entire uh, education system, we have not brought in sustainability and sustainability uh, sort of you know spreads across any discipline that you study. Uh, any kind of science and any kind of uh, social science, human science also you study. So what might be uh, taking from where, uh, taking off from where uh, Nitesh left and Ajay also pointed out is I think we need to make very simple frameworks to, to start with, you know, for what do you want to go tomorrow? If you ask me that question is to make uh, some kind of a framework in which every process or every startup will, will showcase their sustainability or their greenness and arrive at some kind of points, which is very simple. I mean, we are very adaptable and of course we will review it uh, later on when, our, when, the, when the body which he has suggested will come into being. So this, when you start showcasing that your industry has certain greenness on some kind of a scale, which is verifiable, then everybody would like, there'd be a, some kind of a wave which everybody tries to show. So then you are trying to focus that it's not enough to be environmentally uh, sustainable, but also you need to be green because you're thinking to reverse a whole set of environmental issues that you've brought in. I think this is the very first issue. And somewhere along the line, I don't know if we can quickly put in uh, these kind of greenness into uh, a curriculum, but what we can quickly do is when we are training the innovators into business practices, and giving them a, for a front end training. Okay, how do you a very quick one week or a 10 week training like what the Deshpande Foundation does? Uh, it is there we can introduce a couple of uh, approaches to say how green you are and a set of metrics. So the emerging, emerging uh, uh, innovators are already into the business of showcasing their greenness and also planning for greenness. I think this is where uh, we as a body could make a simple uh, framework to say, how do we showcase? So along with your uh, customer identification, customer awareness and other aspects of business that we do, we, we train, we add a couple of these things say, are you green? And can you showcase this green in your brand? So this will make an appeal and this is an immediate effect. How we bring it into curricula, how do we uh, train the next generation, whoever use, uh, is going to bring up uh, any, any set of innovators is something it's still open because the, how do we teach sustainability to India, which has been sustainable for 4,000 years is a very difficult question, and a very difficult uh, path. And this is somewhere we all have to do some brainstorming. I don't have immediate answers. I worked 40 years on sustainability, but if, I, if somebody really asked me, 
if you're going to teach and you're going to tell indians that you're not sustainable then they will immediately ask you for 4000 years how did they survive and what is it that they have made difference so we need to approach sustainability with a very different way and perhaps bring in the future generation and the burden that we are going to give them as a major yardstick to bring in some guilt for and so that you become green this may be something that we will have to think how do we do it and bring it into our curricula as well thank you i think that's a wonderful point that you made there dr chanakya um it's uh, it, it's it's very difficult to to argue um, with anybody who comes with that kind of a, a very strong kind of very factual statement i would say i completely agree with that uh, dr ajay you want to add something to that yeah i think i uh, while agreeing with dr chanakya in fact one of the thing which has hap- which is being happening in last 10 years i should call it as a environmental disclosures in fact if you really see now uh, the the environmental disclosures are not only required from environmental regulator but even from the financial regulator like sebi or some other companies act everybody is now asking the companies to come forward and disclose the data first i think that is making a huge impact and though many of the uh, financial disclosures are not really much mandatory or it is not coming for all sectors but i see a hope that in coming years uh, this disclosure will be playing a very important role when we talk about the sustainability as well as sustainable chemistry whatever it is so i think that that is going to make a difference and another thing the role of the independent directors in the company is also changing and they are coming in because on one side if you are violating from environmental point of view there is a huge risk of prosecution plus environmental damage charges and that is really pushing the uh, this topic cleaner production sustainable chemistry all these are being pushed uh, through the environmental regulations also so these two aspects will be playing a very critical role in coming years thank you yeah i was um, about to mention the aspect of uh, the environmental disclosures um that have taken you know the the for the forefront in the discussion um but i do see that there are gaps in what they are asking in terms of disclosures so i'm i'm sure that the framework would uh, evolve to that uh, complexity um in in due course of time and i i would like to ask uh, mr nitesh about uh, you know the the authenticity the validity of such disclosures what is your um what has your experience been as a businessman in terms of uh, uh, what you see happening in india in terms of validating and authenticity of disclosures so i i think the scenario was quite uh, different about uh, maybe Uh, 10 20 years back uh, when we started uh, our uh, company uh, one of the things that we are observing especially in the last 5 to uh, 10 years is that that trend is uh, changing uh, and uh, one uh, uh, key reason for that is that the uh, the cost that is involved for not disclosing the correct information is slowly uh, increasing uh so the government is tightening the laws around uh you know in case you give a wrong kind of an information or a disclosure the cost that the company or the directors could pay is pretty high uh so earlier uh, you know even when various companies used to go to a pollution control board for various of documentations and uh, to get various kinds of consent for operation uh, the authenticity of that data and whatever uh, level those disclosures used to happen uh uh you know was uh, uh kind of way uh kind of off being accurate uh, as compared to what it is uh, uh, today especially uh, purely because uh, uh you know they know the cost involved they know that in case uh, it is uh, you know it comes to somehow it comes to light that this disclosure is not appropriate uh, uh the cost Uh, or the punishment that could be involved could be uh, very drastic uh, and i think that is one thing that's making uh, uh, you know companies get more authentic around it uh, while i would love to see this 
compliance based drivenness getting converted into commitment based uh, drivenness uh, and how uh, and you know if the senior management sees this as their responsibility towards their stakeholders to disclose the authentic information and you know coming out of that commitment that they want to really authentically disclose uh, all the information related to environment i think that's um, you know the 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 the, the stakeholder and the shareholder expectations are probably going to drive the whole um, disclosure uh, development and also the framework development and uh, some of the other initiatives that Dr. Ajay also spoke about. Um, I think, he, you know, I, I don't see any specific questions from the audience in the Q&A box we have here and since we have another seven or eight minutes on the session uh, what i would like to do is i would like to invite uh, our panelists to 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 quickly you know share a couple of uh, words as our uh, as an ending statement um, to close the session probably then we can conclude there um, let me, I can start with Mr. Nitesh, if you want to say something as a concluding statement. Yeah, I think a critical piece of this entire discussion is, uh, you know, what was pointed out earlier was the, you know, uh, medium and small size uh, enterprises who are into chemical manufacturing. I think they form the backbone of Indian chemical uh, manufacturing. A whole bunch of contract manufacturing they do for the uh, you know, mid-size or the large companies or the multinational companies. Uh, all that is being done by the MSMEs uh, uh, in the chemical sector. Uh, and this MSMEs uh, uh, deal with or face a lot of constraint in terms of space constraints in their plan, financial constraints, technical constraints, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, other constraints. And, uh, uh, you know, they not being having in-house R&D. Uh, that's another constraint that they can't solve their own environmental uh, challenges. And that's one place where I really believe that something extraordinary needs to be done by all stakeholders, uh, something that the government can do. Yet one of the uh, things that uh, Dr. Ajay pointed out at the Gujarat Cleaner Production Center, GCPC, they had this uh, initiative that, uh, you know, if you are, uh, as a chemical company, you are implementing some technology or some equipment that would help you reduce your environmental footprint, they uh, and you have proven that it has got installed or implemented, they give you 75% of reimbursement of that cost. Now, that kind of an incentive really works well for a small and medium-sized industry to take that one uh, step uh, forward, uh, you know, take that risk of implementing uh, that technology or available solution to solve their environmental problem. Uh, so that kind of an initiative uh, from uh, government as a stakeholder could uh, really work. Uh, the second thing that can really work for MSME is the role that academic and research institutes can face or can play to contribute to solving their environmental uh, problems. Uh, so if the uh, local research institutes that are available in various industrial uh, areas, if they could come forward, ask industries for their problems and let their you know, masters or PhD students work on those problems and come out with some, uh, you know, workable solution for the industry that would help the industry, small and medium sized industry, because they don't have their own internal uh, R&D center. So uh, I think it's a very synergistic approach where uh, the MSME who doesn't have an R&D setup and uh, the research institute or the academic institutes who's sitting with that kind of a setup and that kind of a fundamental uh, knowledge that they could really break down the problem into very, uh, you know, uh, like a scientific problem and then solve that problem at a scientific level and then give it back to the industry as an implementable solution. So I think uh, MSME uh, to conclude uh, is uh, a very uh, kind of key backbone of the Indian chemical industry and uh, uh, something, you know, uh, extraordinary or something different really needs to be done uh, to make sure that they grow much more stronger and they are hand-holded uh, 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 so that their you know production capacities expand. True. Um, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Chanakya to say a few words. Yeah, thank you. I taking on from where uh, uh, Dr. Nilesh Mehta left. I I think he brought it out the right direction that there needs to be some kind of a 
synergy between the academia and the uh, small and medium industries, which are really require these kind of issues. One, um, an immediate thing would be uh, trying to make a compendium as to what kind of uh, products that are, I mean, now let me not call it waste, but byproducts that are coming out from various uh, systems can become inputs into another system. Because nobody knows how do we dispose the waste. We always find a consultant who's really trying to say, how do I get rid of it and not how to use it. So if you start building this compendium that this industry produces something which is a byproduct, is there another use for it? In a typical industrial ecology approach that, you know, where we call circular economy, we expand it to an industrial ecology where there is no, in the whole overall geographic area, there are no uh, ways. This is something that uh, would be of uh, great help. And I, I think that is of, uh, uh, of uh, urgent uh, need today. And I, I, that's all I would like to say. And of course, the uh, there is, uh, just like GCPC, I think we need to look at a state level body which can start solving the problem and incentivize this kind of conversion to greenness how the policy emerges let that is a different negotiation but if these are added into the idea and that we are incentivizing rather than merely uh, looking at it as a regulatory body then i think we are on the right track thank you yeah i think that's a wonderful point incentivization rather than purely regulatory action uh, that's a that's a great takeaway from there dr rajay um, can i come to you yeah uh, in fact uh, uh, if you really see what dr sanek has said that that is already in process like uh, you have uh, something called as a reutilization of the west in the hazardous waste regulation where actually the rule 9 allows the reutilization in west and there are more than 50 standard operating process uh, procedures which have been notified and significant data is available on that at the same time there are initiatives something like green pro uh, which are which in which gives a complete uh, range of products which are available in a very recycled manner but the point in fact what we are talking about uh, avoidance of the waste not the util reutilization of the waste so the focus of the sustainable chemistry or a green chemistry should be on the upscaling. That is, uh, if we try to avoid generation of the waste, that's that's always good, rather than utilizing and reutilizing. So I think that is one. And I fully appreciate there is a huge need of industry academia research. It comes only when, like some pollution control board asks for a new increase in pollution load or something like that, then only the interaction happens. Hardly a few industries which are actually interacting with the academy on a research front, uh, which is unlike the Europe or the uh, US setting. So I think this is one area where uh, it has to be proactive from both the sides, not only from industry, but even from academic side, there has to be a strong uh, sort of marketing of the knowledge available at the academic institutes. And then I think uh, if it is a uh, good combination, definitely a lot of good things can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajay. Uh, Dr. Sandra, would you like to say a couple of lines? Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Um, maybe two points. Uh, the, the first one is uh, is hearing like the need for this, you know, simple guiding considerations uh, to start with. Uh, we very much hope that the, the 10 objective can be in a way put in the wall for by by every type of stakeholders, not only uh, SMEs and startups, but and and guiding you know the the, the work that is being done, whether it's uh, uh, the financial sector who is uh, looking into funding innovation, whether it's it's uh, policies, um, industry or or uh, local level um, actors. Uh, so so that's really the the first point, and it's. The intention is to inspire. The intention is to go around this track, and then um, certainly the <laughs> testing and the, the um, reality of a one uh, SME or one startup might not exactly meet everything, but that that's probably uh, just showing the path 
um, towards green and sustainable chemistry. Uh, and the second point I, I wanted to highlight is, uh, is the design aspect. It's, it's really, I, I hear and I completely agree with the, the, uh, the industrial ecology um, uh, and dimension and with the work that can be done within industrial parks, actually, even at, at a very specific level into uh, finding a way for byproducts. From a purely chemical point of view, the design aspects and, and making sure that, that chemicals that are problematic and that are concerned is, are not uh, designed into the processes and products, then that will facilitate this um, uh, on the second run. So I, I wanted to highlight this and also to thank uh, extremely the, the, the different panelists for mentioning several times the Gujarat and CPC. Um, they are actually, you know, uh, the National Cleaner Production Center are, are part of a network, the resource efficiency uh, network, and it's being patronage by, by UNEP and by UNIDO. Yes. Uh, so we have been working for 20 years with this uh, institution, and it's great to see it uh, recognized and to see how um, useful uh, they are uh, at national and, and local level. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandra. I think um, we, you've had some really um, key and significant inputs from all our panelists today. And uh, they have uh, given us a lot of homework to follow up on, I would say. Um, because we are not going to stay still. I think um, ISC3 and STP have come together, and now I'm sure. Uh, UNEP is going to be with us um, to move forward with this, and uh, we will take it forward in a in 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 a larger way to make sure that you know our objective is fulfilled and we get a wider absorption of technologies and we see some transformation happening across different uh, industry sectors in India. Uh, I have I one last like point. To... Yes. Yeah, Chanakya here. Yes, I one last point. I think we forgot one thing that is very important for us is to really um, put together a whole lot of success stories and saying so that that brings together um, a bunch of understanding that this is the direction we have to go. It is successful because every time there is an environmental issue, the only thing people hear is doomsday. And I think we have to reverse that uh, human thought that is coming by success stories. And I think that has to be a, an important part of uh, the agenda that how do we create success stories? How do we bring confidence that we can bring back greenness to this planet? And, and that's coming from the chemistry side. Thank you. I think that's a very important aspect. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, the 10 webinars that we have planned are going to look at um, each of the 10 principles in depth. And uh, we have, um, and we also have a call open right now for inviting startups and SMEs in India, um, and even if it's overseas, it's fine, to to share their case studies and their success stories with us, so that we can uh, use them as the driving and the motivational force to attract others. Um, just so that uh, you know, we uh, encourage everybody else to join us. I would like to invite uh, Juanita to quickly share with us some of the stories that we have shortlisted. Yes, thank you very much, Vikram. Hello, everyone. My name is Juanita Halblob, and I am the International Relations Manager of the IC3. As we spoke today all the time, the holistic approach is very important to us. How can we sustainable? We have to be holistic in everything that we do. And as Dr. Chanakin was saying, it's very important to have shining examples to inspire other people to be part of the movement of sustainable and green chemistry. Therefore, we had this call for startup and innovators because we wanted to figure out to give them a place where they can showcase their examples and motivate other people of being part of this movement. Um, before we conclude today, some of them are today in the webinar and I want to highlight them. Uh, you guys are going to be part of our webinar series. We were going to inform you and send you an email. Thank you very much for participating. Um, 
our first startup that we chose is Albert World. The CEO is Vladas Snikus. Um, they are focusing in creating microalgae cultivating technology with a very high nutrient range, rich algae cells. Then our second startup is Ashaya Anish and they're a social entrepreneurship. Um, they focus on waste management. Um, then we have Coco Custo, CEO is Shan Lalvani. Um, they are producing clean products for laundry dishes and, surf and surfaces. So clean products and they are non-toxic. Then we have EcoWork, CEO is Dipali Sinia. Um, EcoWork is working in, in also in e-waste and different recycling practices. Then we also have mini mines. There are clean tech solution and the CEO is Anupam Kumar. We have then ProClean Technologies um, and the CEO is Cartier. Um, they do probiotic based technology. And then we have Revy Environment Solutions with the CEO Vanita Prasad. They are working in, wa in wastewater treatment technology. Then we have Schutzen, CEO is Raj Mahendra Tana. And they are specialized in producing chemicals. And then we have Vidijai Agri Technologies with the CEO Amit Kumar, and they are working in ag agriculture technology. So as you can see, we have many different startups with very different sectors, but they have in common sustainable and green chemistry. So we're very excited to have them on board. Um, and as uh, Vikram was saying, we're going to have our sustainable chemistry club and the following up webinars, we were going to talk about the framework and each specific objective and also about the startups, how they match these objectives so that you guys know how the framework works and how you can implement the framework to know are you sustainable or not, or what can you do to be more sustainable? Thank you. Thank you, Juanita. Um, I think we can conclude the session, but before that, I would like to say that, we, you know, putting the pieces together, we've talked about everything from a, a nodal agency uh, or a nodal body that gives the technical direction or the vision for this kind of a um, mainstream discussion on sustainable chemistry. We spoke about the development of a framework that guides the evolution of um, technology adoption and also the policy framework around it. Um, we spoke about the role of international uh, guidelines such as the UNEP's guidelines um, and any other uh, ones that are being developed by the, the Indian government and the pollution control boards here coming together. Uh, we also put the topic of stakeholder conversions and life cycle assessment, the life cycle thinking part of it, and the importance of education, uh, not just early education of the next generation of uh, engineers and scientists, but also of the middle management and the senior management to a large extent to drive the adoption of these technologies. Um, we've spoken about the importance of highlighting case studies and success stories, uh, which we are going to do in the webinars um, after this session. Um, I would like to conclude by um, you know, expressing my gratitude to, to all the speakers um, that have participated in this uh, session and to ISC3, to STP, to UNEP, GIZ, and uh, Dekima. Um, uh, I can see from last year, from two, two stakeholders, we've grown to almost six now. And uh, I look forward to you know, uh, Mr. Atul Bagai also involving and uh, motivating the, the Chemistry Council to join us. Um, we're also speaking with the Ministry of uh, Chemicals and uh, Fertilizers to, to, to support us. Um, so I think a lot of uh, development is happening uh, in India as pointed out by our speakers. And we have 
um, a lot of uh, opportunities to look forward to to you know uh, to to make sure that uh, the technologies that are being developed and the principles that are being evolved are put to good use and for um, for us to see the social uh, social and environmental impact that we are hoping to achieve i think uh, if um, if i may conclude the session with your permission if uh, um, is there anything that dr alexis wants to speak about and then we can conclude the session now i have nothing to add thank you okay wonderful so i think we will conclude the session thank you everyone thank you all the audience for attending and um dr janakya you raised your hand you're on mute i said thank you good wonderful job. and um, i urge everyone to to uh, visit our website and um, you know we will share some updates and the call for startups and for the next webinars on our website please follow us on linkedin and other um, social media sites uh, for updates thank you thank you everyone thank you